This is the BBC Home Service. Here is the midnight news. The election. With only 13 results to come, 12 of them university seats, it is now certain that Labour will have a majority of more than 130 over all parties. Here is the new shape of the House of Commons. Labour, 390 seats. Conservatives and Nationals, 198. Labour Nationals, 14. Liberal so 640 MPs are elected to a new British Parliament. What are they like, these elected representatives of the people? Here, in a quiet suburban road, it might be in any town or in any part of the country, lives just an ordinary family. John Harrison, until recently a flight lieutenant in the RAF. His daughter, Betty, making sandcastles while the sun shines. And, of course, his wife, Mary. John still feels rather surprised at finding himself an MP. With Mary to help, he fought a whirlwind election campaign, hoping he might be able to help in building a better life for the people of Britain, particularly for the ex-service man whom he had come to know so well during the six years of war. Well, John Harrison was elected, and here he goes to the House of Commons for the first time, there to take his seat with the rest of the newly elected members. Mary sees him off at the gate, and with last-minute advice, wishes him good luck. John arrives at the station and realizes with very human pleasure that in future he won't have to pay for a ticket, for amongst many other privileges, MPs travel free between their constituency, their homes and the House of Commons. It's quite an adventure, this first journey. And as the train pulls out of the station, John's mind is full of the things he plans to do. Houses, jobs, agriculture, schools, yes, there must be better education, hospitals, a new health service. So engrossed is he in his thoughts, he doesn't realize he's reached Parliament Square. Frankly, Parliament Square doesn't realize it either. This may be the first day of a new Parliament, but to the teeming millions of Londoners hurrying about their business, it's just another day. For John, as he gets off the bus, it's a big moment. The Palace of Westminster once, in fact, a king's palace. The commons came as guests, stayed as tenants, and are now the owners. This is to be John's workshop, where, with all the other members, he will strive to secure for Britain peace and prosperity and the happiness of her people. Here, yeah, where are you going, sir? It was something of a shock that John's pulled up by the police. He explains that he's one of the new members, and the policeman memorizes his face and wishes him good luck. Well, that was the first hurdle. John now makes his way through Westminster Great Hall into St. Stephen's Hall with its statues of bygone statesmen. I wonder how they felt when they first entered Parliament. Pitt, did he expect to be called on to save his country against Napoleon? Some village Hamden, did he think he would condemn a king? Falkland and Walpole. The man who let sleeping dogs lie. And John Harrison? John Harrison had better get a move on. St. Stephen's Hall, once a chapel, was the old-time meeting place of the commons. Here came knights from the shires, burgesses from the town, and commoners. In the middle of the last century, the commons moved into a new and larger chamber. That was destroyed by Hitler's bombers. As John enters the present debating chamber, once the House of Lords, he feels pretty small. It seems strange that he should be part of all this tradition and history, a member of Parliament. Well, he came early to get a seat, so he might as well look for one. No, too far away. He must have a place where he can catch the speaker's eye. That is, if he really wants to get a word in. A little nearer. Here, just below the gangway. 
Yes, that's better. Government members sit on the right of the speaker's chair, opposition members on the left. No seats are reserved. As a matter of fact, they're not enough to go around, and on important occasions, many members have to stand. The clerks of the house in wig and gown have arrived. They're there as experts, and when called upon, they give advice to the speaker and members in their duties. The first job of a new parliament is to elect a speaker. He's really the chairman, but in this case, he is called Mr. Speaker, though in fact, he never makes a speech. His job originally was to act as spokesman between the commons and the king. 11 o'clock. The clerk of the house rises and points to a government backbencher who is to propose another member for the position of speaker. He mentions the member's good qualities, how he has proved impartial, tactful, patient, well-versed in procedure, a good chairman. No party politics enter into this ceremony. The speaker is chosen for his personal merits, not his political beliefs. An opposition member supports the motion. It is many years now since he first entered the House of Commons. The proposed speaker was a new member at the same time, and many years of work together have proved him honest and fair in all his dealings. He can only hope that when he is sitting in the chair, his eyes will be sufficiently good to see the members of the opposition who may possibly have a word to say. Now, here's a curious thing. Mover and seconder go to lead the speaker-elect to the chair, and he resists. Surely an odd procedure for a man who is going to receive a salary of 5,000 a year and a house free. But in olden times, when Parliament and King were in conflict, it was not a healthy job and men had to be dragged to it. We preserve the memory of those days in this ceremony in order that we may not have to live through them again. By the following day, the royal approval has been granted to the Speaker's election, and he thanks the Commons for the high honour they have conferred upon him. It is an honor not without great responsibilities. It's by him that speakers are selected in debates. It is on his authority that the traditional rights of parliament are maintained. The speaker's first official duty takes place the following day. Fully robed in the dignity of his new office, he presides over the swearing in of the new members. The clerk of the house takes from the treasury box a copy of the Oath of Fealty and a Bible. Row by row, members come forward. Government front bench first, then the opposition alternately. It's a solemn moment, this taking of the oath, with its reminder of the days when a sovereign overlord held power of life and death over the people of this country. The commons have traveled far since the days when the barons first curbed the power of King John at Runnymede and many names later to become famous have been inscribed on the roll of the Commons, in which the names of all members of Parliament have been entered since the House first began to sit. The new member is led forward and announced to the Speaker, who congratulates him and wishes him happiness in the House, and at the same time tries to familiarise himself with his face and name. At last, it's John's turn. I, John Harrison, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to His Majesty King George, his heirs and successors, according to law, so help me God. Now John signs the roll, and like those before him, moves forward to be recognized by the Speaker. Good luck, John Harrison. May I wish you success in your mission and happiness in this house. Now John can go home, for the remainder of the day is taken up with the completion of the swearing-in, a long and tedious formality. The official opening of Parliament. Outside in Parliament Square, crowds are cheering the King and Queen. Inside, the members of the Commons sit behind locked doors, doors bolted and barred against the King, for he is their traditional enemy and is not allowed into the house. And even his messenger, Black Rod, has to knock thrice to be granted admission. Suddenly there's a hush. Black Rod. Crossing the bar of the house, Black Rod approaches the speaker, bowing three times.
In age-old words, he delivers his message. Mr. Speaker, the King commands this honourable house. to attend His Majesty immediately in the House of Peers. The Sergeant at Arms takes up his position by the mace. The Speaker, clad in his ceremonial robes, rises and accompanied by Black Rod and preceded by the Sergeant at Arms, the procession makes its way to what is known in the Commons as the Other Place. Behind the Speaker, the members of the House, Government and Opposition, side by side, solemnly proceed on their way to the Lords. On their return from the House of Lords, the Speaker rises to say that he has listened to the King's speech and for the sake of greater accuracy, he has secured a copy. He then reads the speech to the Commons, many of whom have already heard it, and who are, like the Speaker, in possession of a printed copy. But these things must be done with a due sense of the dignity of the House. Now, the point about the King's speech is that it's not the King's speech at all. It's an outline of the government's policy for the coming session or year of Parliament. And although it's spoken by the King, it's written by the Prime Minister, assisted by the members of his government. And to John, listening to the speech for the second time, it seems as though they'll never get on with their job of governing. And he looks around the house with some impatience and boredom. He notices a top hat, and idly wonders at this incongruous note. He didn't even know that hats were allowed in the chamber. Well, they are. In fact, at times, they're essential. John's attention is recalled by the proposal of a motion that a humble address be presented to His Majesty, thanking His Majesty for his most gracious speech. Now, nobody objects to thanking the King for his speech, but many members may want to object quite strongly to the government's programme which it outlines. So, members thank His Majesty, but add amendments regretting that the speech fails to mention whatever the member thinks has been omitted. Many such amendments are moved, the Speaker selecting for debate those which have secured the backing of a majority of the members. Up in the gallery, shorthand writers take notes of everything that is said. By eight o'clock the next morning, it will have been printed for all to read. And by the way, this official report of the day's proceedings is known as Hansard. The name dates from the days before the House arranged for its own reporting, and the job was done by a man called Hansard. The name remains. It's the usual practice of the House that as soon as one member sits down, a dozen or more jump up to continue the debate. The Speaker calls on one of them, and the disappointed ones resume their seats, but they'll be up again later. Suddenly there's a cry of order, order. The member now speaking has unwittingly broken one of the rules of the house. His foot is over the edge of the carpet. In olden times, politics were more robust than they are today, and members wore swords. To step over the edge of the carpet brought the speaker within sword distance of the opposition. And although members no longer carry swords, the old rule still persists. Apart from rulings on points of order, it's the Speaker's job to see that members keep to the point in their speeches. If he requires any confirmation of his opinion, he'll consult the clerks. The debate continues. Members come and go as they like. But there must always be a Speaker in the chair. So Mr. Speaker has a deputy who relieves him when he gets hungry, or when it's necessary for him to carry out one of the many other duties which are attached to his job. His relief is the Deputy Speaker, who also acts as Chairman of Ways and Means. When he takes over, he's informed of the stage the debate has reached, and of the various matters in the order paper which have still to be raised. The Speaker now leaves the chamber, the House continuing to sit under the direction of the Deputy. The Order Paper. All parliamentary business is governed by strict rules of procedure, evolved from centuries of practice and adaptation. Each day a new order paper is printed. It's really the agenda of the day's business in Parliament. It lists the questions that are to be put to ministers, the bills which will be dealt with that day, and all other matters with which the House is concerned. Let's see how it works in practice. Here's the Speaker putting to the House the first reading of a new bill. At this stage, however, the bill is not read at all. The first reading is a formality 
which announces the bill and frees it for publication to members and other interested parties. When the Speaker says, those in favour say aye, those against say no, nobody in fact says anything, and the Speaker announces that the ayes have it. The House now passes on to the next item on the order paper. The bill, having passed its first reading, will now become the subject of discussion both inside and outside Parliament. Interested sections of the general public will begin making representations to their MPs, asking for amendments to this, that, or the other clause. There are many ways of influencing members on the terms of a bill, and one of these is by correspondence. There's a post office in the House of Commons just off the central lobby. Here, letters for members are collected and sorted ready for them. John Harrison collects his post and answers it when he gets home. A member will get anything up to 80 letters a day, ranging from requests for him to get licenses to open businesses, uh, for information on various aspects of the export problem, passports, rights of ways. In fact, as John sits at his desk, it seems that all the world is in trouble, and most of it finding its way to him. It's interesting enough for John, these sidelights on other people's problems, and he has Mary to help him with his letter writing. Young Betty, however, is not as happy. With mother and father so occupied, she feels rather out of things and wants to know what she can do to help. What can Betty do? Well, let's see. I know. Why don't you stick on stamps? That'll keep you busy and be useful. Now, that's just what Betty wanted. Daddy says I can stick on stamps. All right, well, put your tongue out. No, properly, properly. That's better. With his daughter settled down to a new job, John gets on with his correspondence. Another way of getting in touch with your MP is by lobbying. Here's an usher bringing into the chamber what's known as a green card. It bears the member's name and the nature of the inquiry. Ushers must not cross the bar of the house, and so the card is passed from hand to hand until it reaches the member for whom it is intended. In this case, it's John Harrison who is being lobbied. As John leaves, he bows towards the Speaker's chair. This habit dates from the time when the House met in St. Stephen's Chapel and members bowed to the altar there. In the central lobby, John meets his constituent. A bill to deal with housing sites is due to come up for its second reading soon, and John has had many queries in connection with it, and this is just another of them, and it's of great interest to him as he's decided to make his maiden speech during the second reading of this bill. At home, John works far into the night composing the speech. He hopes it will create a stir in the house. But he's going to try it out first on his wife, and she certainly won't mind criticizing it. She appreciates how important it is. You see, it's to be his very first speech in the House of Commons, and she is as anxious as he that it should be a success. This particular bill, the Land Development Bill, would give power to local authorities to take over land for building purposes, and John has strong views about it. In his election campaign, he pledged himself to do his utmost to provide homes for the people, and you can't build houses unless you have land to build them on. Mary's been able to help him quite a lot. During the years when John was away, she experienced the difficulties and miseries of shared houses and temporary lodgings, and knows only too well what happens when two women have to use the same kitchen. The great day arrives. With a speech in his pocket, John goes down to the house. He takes his wife with him, partly because she wants to go, partly because, like the rest of us, John's a little vain and wants to show off, and partly because, to tell the truth, he feels more than a little nervous, and it'll be a comfort to feel the sympathetic presence of his wife in the gallery. The debate on the land development bill is already in progress when John and Mary arrive. John knew that the first few speeches would be pretty straightforward statements of policy by the leaders of the various parties. And it would not be until after these speeches that ordinary members would get a chance to speak, or to catch the speaker's eyes, it's called. And even then, many will be disappointed. And it's a wise move for members wishing to speak 
to rely not so much on catching the speaker's eye at the time, but in catching his ear beforehand and letting him know that they have a particular reason for wishing to join in the debate. The government member sits down and John leaps to his feet with enthusiasm, but the speaker calls someone else. Yes, John may feel very important, but one of the things a new member must learn is that there are some 600 other members with exactly the same rights as himself. And although the speaker will normally give preference to an MP who wants to make a maiden speech, there are a lot of other members in this parliament with exactly the same privileges as John Harrison. As it rests entirely with the speaker, who he will call next, John will just have to go on trying. John passes the time of waiting by going through his notes and trying to remember what he meant to say. We may not read a speech in the house, but only refer to notes. At last, the speaker calls on John Harrison. Yes, John, it's really you this time. He asks the House to bear with him in this, his first contribution, and hopes they will grant him the indulgence usual to all new members. Housing, he says, is potentially the most explosive problem in Britain today. During recent years, this country has been engaged in a life and death struggle, which left us no time to consider the peace and quiet of our homes or the welfare of our families. It has been a struggle that at one time might in very truth have forced us to fight on the beaches, in the fields, and in the streets of our cities. Happily, those times are past, but they have left an awful aftermath. Not only were there no houses built throughout the years of labor and suffering, but the relentless bombers of the enemy had wreaked a greater havoc. Throughout the country, one out of every three houses has been destroyed or damaged. Millions of families have been deprived of their homes. The government were doing all they could to remedy this disastrous situation. Shattered windows, leaking roofs, and bomb-blasted doors were being repaired. But the key to the situation was not this make, do and mend, but a full and comprehensive plan of new buildings. The house listens with interest. John has a good presence and a clear speaking voice. He puts his case well. Mary is extremely proud of him. John, feeling more at home, develops his argument. This problem of houses is not one to be used for party propaganda. It is a major operation and must be planned as carefully and as certainly as the great operations of war. Mr. Speaker, it is for these reasons I feel it the duty of this House to support the bill before it. If the government is to be held responsible for building houses, it must be granted the power necessary to make this possible. Houses cannot be built in the air or on the shifting sands of election promises. They must be built on land and founded on the rock of sound planning. Our great wartime leader demanded, give us the tools and we will finish the job. I say, Give us power to acquire land, and we will produce the houses. John sits down amidst murmurs of approval from all sides of the house. The next speaker begins with congratulations. He would do this whether John had done well or badly, for this is the custom of the house. But on this occasion, he can do so sincerely, for John has really done rather well. The debate continues with many speakers, both for and against, until Mr. Speaker rises to move that the bill be read a second time. All those in favor say aye. Aye, cry the government. Those against, no. No, answer the opposition. The ayes have it, says Mr. Speaker. No, echo the opposition. The ayes have it. No, the opposition are insistent. Clear the lobbies, orders Mr. Speaker. The division bell is rung, and members leave the chamber. At the end, they will divide, some going into the aye lobby, and some into the no lobby. The speaker remains in his chair. Division lobbies run either side of the chamber, and members circulate through them. At the end of each lobby, there sits a clerk who will put a tick against each member as he passes to register his vote. Members returning pass behind the speaker's chair back into the house. A division takes anything up to eight to ten minutes, and sometimes there'll be many divisions in a day. In an all-night sitting, there may be anything up to twenty and members get quite a lot of exercise walking through the lobbies. Divisions also make a welcome break in the debate. If during a division, a member wishes to raise a point of order, he must do so seated and covered. John now sees the use of the top hat he had previously derided. If the hat fits, well and good. If not, the member is still in order. 
Mr. Speaker announces the result of the division. The Land Development Bill has passed its second reading by a large majority. As an MP, John finds the amount of work he has to get through tough going. So he has secured an office and a secretary. And to tell the truth, MPs are very badly accommodated in the House of Commons itself, and a member is lucky who can do his work with his own secretary in his own office, away from the precincts of the chamber. John's post bag grows and the number of files accumulate. The telephone also adds to his distractions, for MPs are popular people. Not only must they attend to the queries and problems of their own constituents, but many people from all over the country will also seek to enlist their help. As well as their normal parliamentary duties, most MPs specialise in a particular branch of government. They may be on committees dealing with foreign affairs, industry, employment, or in association with other MPs, they may look after the interests of different groups of people, such as ex-servicemen, builders, or that much maligned army of black coat workers, the civil servants. But whichever aspect of public life they choose to represent, it will entail additional work and an ever-increasing volume of correspondence. What's this? A letter from a Mrs. Brown, one of John's own constituents. She's in difficulties about some land. Would Mr. Harrison help? John acknowledges her letter and asks for more precise particulars. Now the land development bill goes to committee, where it will be examined clause by clause, paragraph by paragraph, and line by line. Important bills such as this, which require the spending of public funds, may be dealt with by what is called the Committee of the Whole House. The Sergeant at Arms lowers the mace from the top rack to the lower rack to indicate that the House is in committee. And the Speaker, accompanied by the Clerk of the House, leaves the chamber. His place will be taken by the Chairman of Committee, who does not sit in the Speaker's chair, but in the clerk's seat. Members have put down many amendments designed to improve the bill. Not all will be debated. Some will be quite unimportant and some the government will accept. But the Chairman will see that the important and controversial ones are fully discussed. The first amendment is a government one. The governments often amend their own bills in committee, in the light of representations made to them inside and outside the House. The amendment now being dealt with provides that a local authority would not have to wait to get possession of land until the price to be paid for it has been settled. The amendment gives power to take immediate possession, leaving any dispute about price to be settled by arbitration. Now it's the business of the opposition to watch points, and an opposition member asks for an assurance that arbitration will be by the well-tried machinery already existing, and that no change is contemplated. The minister gives the desired assurance. A government supporter intervenes, Will the minister assure the committee that no landowners will be permitted to make a profit out of the operations of the proposed bill? The minister says that the price paid will be based on 1939 land values and that the public purse will not be robbed. A more controversial amendment is to follow. An opposition speaker moves that the bill shall not apply to land purchased for development by private builders. Surely, he says, the minister is putting all his eggs in one basket, the local authorities. Before the war, private enterprise built four out of every five houses in Britain. Give private builders freedom of action and they will soon solve the problem. No, says a government backbencher, it was private enterprise which was responsible for the scandal of ribbon development after the First World War. Private enterprise built houses for sale. What we need is our houses to be let at reasonable rents. He lashes out at land speculators and profiteers. An indignant opposition member gets up in vehement protest and John, angry at this interruption, shouts for order. An older member soothes John down. He explains that in this place you may or may not like what a member is saying, but he has as much right to say it as anyone else. Parliament agrees with Voltaire's dictum. Sir, I do not agree with a single word you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Indeed, members of Parliament are privileged to say in the House anything they will, even though it would be libelous if uttered outside. John is very thoughtful at this. But he's learning, learning that Parliament is an old and ancient institution whose rights have been built up by centuries of struggle.
At home that night, John deals with some of his overdue correspondence. He finds a letter from Mrs. Brown stating her case in full. Her husband has been in the army throughout the war. Their little business in East London was blitzed and she moved out to the suburbs. She'd only been able to obtain a temporary wooden shop, but had paid a deposit on a piece of land adjoining it on which she had hoped after the war to build a home and a permanent business. She now learns that this land is earmarked under the new bill for a local building scheme. Her little business would go, she and her husband would be homeless. Would John help her? Well, he'd try. The House, of course, is in committee when John moves an amendment to exclude from the scope of the bill land belonging to ex-service personnel. He does not wish to embarrass the minister with criticism. He warmly approves of the general purposes of the bill as he made plain in his maiden speech. He feels, however, that precautions must be taken to ensure that the powers sought do not add to the many hardships that already face people returning from the forces. The minister is sympathetic, but he cannot accept the amendment. He refers the honorable member to other amendments designed to limit the bill and states his conviction that if he agreed to them, so many loopholes would be provided that the purpose of the bill would be seriously damaged. The chairman puts the amendment to the vote and the committee divide. John writes to Mrs. Brown. The amendment which I moved today was defeated, but the minister was sympathetic. So next Thursday, I'm going to put a question about it. If you'd like to be present at question time, I'll try to arrange a seat for you in the public gallery. John must give notice of the question he intends to put, so he writes it out in full and hands it to one of the clerks at the table. Thursday, crowds gather as usual in the central lobby for the speaker's procession to pass. chamber, members are assembled for prayers. The usher announces Mr. Speaker and members rise while the procession files solemnly in. upon the rack, Mr. Speaker and his chaplain advance to the table and prayers begin. As the old witticism has it, the chaplain looks at the members and then prays for the country. Prayers over, Mr. Speaker takes his seat and the business of the day begins. The first hour is set aside for questions to ministers. The affairs of two or three departments are taken each day, so that in the course of ten days or so, all the main departments come under scrutiny. A member must give at least a day's notice of the question he wishes to put, so that the minister may be able to collect the material for his reply. The questions themselves are printed on the order paper and numbered. They range from the infinitely big to the infinitely small, from the fate of India to, say, the shortage of hat pins in Bolton. When called upon by the speaker, members merely rise and announce the number of their particular question. The minister reads his reply. If the member is not satisfied with the answer, he can ask a supplementary question. And during question time, query and answer can often be very witty, particularly in the case of a supplementary question which is entirely spontaneous and can easily catch the minister on the wrong foot. In the central lobby comes Mrs. Brown. She is rather overawed by the surroundings in which she finds herself and doesn't quite know what to do. On inquiry, she is directed to the policeman in charge. He asks her to fill up a green card stating her business 
and the name of the member she wishes to see. Inside the house, question time is in full swing. John Harrison receives the card. He leaves his place and goes to the sergeant at arms to secure for Mrs. Brown a ticket which will entitle her to a seat in the gallery. The sergeant at arms, by the way, is responsible under Mr. Speaker's direction for maintaining order in the house. Mrs. Brown enters the gallery. She's been given a copy of the order paper and she feels thrilled that her problem should be the subject of a special question in the Mother of Parliaments. Below, John Harrison resumes his seat. Question and answer continue. Question 33, 34, 35, 36. Question number 37. Mr. Harrison to ask the Minister of Health whether he will take steps to see that the temporary house and shop with land attached, belonging to Mrs. F. Brown, an ex-serviceman's wife situated at N. Bourne, shall not be requisitioned by the local authority for housing purposes. John puts the question and Mrs. Brown waits eagerly for a reply. The Minister answers, in view of the bill now before Parliament, I cannot pronounce on this case. The exercise of the proposed powers will be a matter for the local authorities. I cannot interfere with their discretion. John puts a supplementary. Does the minister know that if the local authority does exercise its power, Mrs. Brown's work will go for nothing, and she and her husband will be homeless and their business ruined? The minister says that with the best will in the world, he cannot usurp the prospective functions of the local authorities under the bill. He's deeply sympathetic, but his powers are limited. This looks like the end, but John has one more card to play. In view of the unsatisfactory nature of the minister's reply, he gives notice that he will raise the matter on the adjournment. Every day before members finally go home, half an hour is devoted to the motion on the adjournment. This is the trump card that members can play. It forces open debate on the government and ventilates their cases to the full. It's no longer for Mrs. Brown that John is fighting. It's for an individual, any individual, whose rights may be threatened by the machinery of government. The strength of British democracy lies in the right of every individual to freedom. If ever we take from our people this heritage, even for the apparent good of the state, then we are forswearing our liberty. The government spokesman replies, the government must have this bill and must use local authorities as their instrument. But the Honourable Member has shown praiseworthy persistence in a case of real hardship. The Minister's Department has been in touch with the local authority at N. Vaughan. And he is happy to say that it is proposed to draw the boundaries of the new building site so that this little property will be excluded. John thanks the Minister. He feels he's done a good job for his constituent and he's grateful to the Minister for his help and cooperation. The Speaker puts the motion for the adjournment and the house breaks up. Throughout the lobbies rings the age-old cry of link boys of former days, who goes home? The light in Big Ben goes out. Parliament rests, but does not sleep, for it is the guardian of our liberties. And so long as it can lay aside the great affairs of state to right or wrong, or uphold the freedom of a citizen, so long as its members do not forget that they are servants of the people, then we may rest secure. For it is for these things we have fought, and it is for these things we shall always fight. For this is the true democracy. This is British freedom.